The writer to the Hebrew says the word of God is living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword, penetrating to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, discerning the thoughts and the attitudes of our hearts. It's an incredible word, the word of God. And we have the privilege to open it together this morning. So let's go to Mark chapter 6. We're looking at verses 30 to 44. Page 1562, if you're using one of the church Bibles. We'll read this story that Pastor Doug talked about with the boys and girls a few moments ago. Mark chapter 6, beginning at verse 30. The apostles gathered, first time, by the way, that Mark uses the term apostles, not disciples, which means literally sent ones, and they had just been sent, so... That's why he changes it. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. Then, because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. By this time it was late in the day, so the disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said, and it's already very late. Send the people away so they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered, you give them something to eat. They said to him, that would take eight months of a man's wages. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? How many loaves do you have? He asked. Go and see. When they found out, they said, five and two fish. Then Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to his disciples to set before the people. He also divided the two fish among them all. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. The number of the men who had eaten was 5,000. Heaven and earth will pass away, but the word of God shall never pass away. Thanks be to God. Well, this miracle has to have been one of the most important miracles that Jesus ever performed because every single one of the gospel writers includes this. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And it is the only miracle recorded in all four Gospels. So I think that points to the importance of this story. This scripture points us to several important principles. I want to kind of walk us through those. There's five principles here that I have for us in the text this morning. But first, I would have you notice how verse 30 connects us back to the story of the disciples being sent out into the countryside and the villages of Judea uh, to preach and to heal and to cast out demons. We looked at that story last week, and you may have noticed, uh, if you're following along in Mark's gospel, that we're skipping over the story of the beheading of John the Baptist. I'm doing that for a reason. Uh, I won't get into all of those reasons right now, but we'll, we can come back to that story. It's kind of a frightening story in many ways, uh, but we can return to that later but I wanted to connect to these two lessons. The lesson today begins with the words that the apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all that they had done and taught. So that brings us to the first principle, which is the principle of accountability. Jesus wants to know from the disciples, well, where have you been? What did you do? How did things go? What, what kinds of things did you teach and, and talk about with people? And, and so they reported back to him, each of the twelve. As a pastor, I expect to be held accountable by the church board, specifically the elders, which are charged with that in the book of church order. 
When I was a member of the military and all of us who uh, are in work, the workforce or have been in the military understand that you have somebody to report to, you have a boss, you have a commanding officer, you, you have someone that you need to uh, be able to be held accountable to. So let me ask you this question this morning. Do you like accountability? Do you like it? Maybe a better question is, do you want to be held accountable? Do you want to? I think every follower of Jesus Christ should want to. Accountability is good for us. For us. Uh, it's a necessary thing for us. It, it can help us to be more obedient, to live more honorable, God-glorifying lives. It can keep us on the paths of righteousness to have to answer to a brother or sister in the Lord or to a group of people in the Lord for what it is we have done. I have to say that I have seen many Christian parents who want to try to hold their children accountable for just about everything. But then they themselves, the parents, don't want to be held accountable as adults and as children of God. That feels like a double standard to me. We should desire accountability. So whether it's with just one other trusted person or maybe it's a trusted small group of friends or fellow believers, we should seek this accountability. We should submit ourselves to one another in love so that we may be careful to walk in God's ways. Let's go on to number two and look at verses 31 and 32 where we see the principle of the Sabbath. There were so many people in Judea pressing around Jesus and around the disciples. Life was so crazy, busy, and demanding that Jesus says to the disciples, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. He's saying, fellows, we need a Sabbath. We need a Sabbath. They'd been traveling all around Judea. They had been carrying on their ministry of healing and casting out demons. They're tired, exhausted. Now, Jesus knew the need for rest in our lives. Jesus knows that we need to come apart. We need to come away for a while. Otherwise, eventually, we will <laughs> come apart. So he has them get into a boat, and they go out onto the Sea of Galilee. And some of you in this church family, I know, have discovered this wonderful thing of getting into a boat I'm going to look at Jack and Nancy a second. Getting into a boat and just going out to a quiet, placid place uh, where your soul can be replenished and you have conversation with each other perhaps or maybe if you're by yourself with God. I used to have that when I was a kid. I grew up on Stony Lake, west of New Era in Oceana County. I used to go out on the lake and sit in the boat and maybe get a line wet. And it was replenishing to my soul. I haven't done that in quite a long time. God has built the need for this rest, this quiet rest into our bodies and into our psyches. And he included in the scriptures an imperative, which we know from the Ten Commandments, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. I like the way the Deuteronomy version puts it. Observe a Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath unto the Lord your God. On it or in it you shall not do any work. That's a pretty straightforward command, isn't it? Pretty straightforward. But Jesus models this divine priority for the ordering of our lives, right? Our weekly pattern, our rhythm of life. Why? For our health and for our wholeness, for our peace of mind. Friends, God is not honored by anyone's workaholism. I had a little bit of an issue with that early on in my ministry, and I needed to seek counseling. I thought God would be honored by my workaholism. No. God is not honored by this push, push, push mentality that's in our culture. 
You ever feel that? So people of God, get your rest. Get your rest. And be sure that you include God in doing it. Let's look at number three. Verses 33 and 34, the principle of compassion. So Jesus and the disciples get into this boat and they head back across the Sea of Galilee. They go to this wilderness place, kind of a deserted area. But the people are so in need and they are so desperate uh, for Jesus, for healing, for whatever it is they're looking for from him, that they run around the lake to find him, to get to Jesus. We're not sure of the actual distance that they did that because we're not given the launching and the landing places of Jesus with the disciples in this boat uh, in our text. But scholars suggest, based on what they can tell from the story and just studying the geography around the Sea of Galilee, that they ran somewhere between three and nine miles in order to get to Jesus. Now, mind you, this is not just a few dozen. This is not just a couple of hundred people. This is a group that numbers in the thousands. As Doug pointed out with the children, there were 5,000 Men, it says. The men. So this does not even include women or any children. So scholars believe that the numbers could have easily exceeded 10,000 people. Imagine. Verse 34, I think, has to be one of the most powerful and poignant verses in the entire Bible. Listen to it again. When Jesus saw them, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. I don't know what your personal view of God is today, but the prevailing and the predominant, the overwhelming image that Jesus gives us of God is one of compassion. Compassion. That word comes from the Latin. That literally means with feeling, with pathos or with passion. The dictionary defines it this way, as an emotion that moves people to the depths of their being and often involves heartfelt sorrow for another person's suffering along with a desire to help. Jesus came to show us that that is a primary character trait of God Almighty. And thus it seems to me that that should be a primary character trait of those who claim to know God, those who claim to follow Christ. The great Christian author C.S. Lewis said that he was taught and believed as he was growing up that God was, quote, an old meanie looking around to see if someone was having a good time so he could put it to a stop, unquote. Where do we get ideas like that? Where do those ideas come from? Sometimes I think those ideas come from religious people who are confused or bitter or angry at God for something, and they have not genuinely experienced God as love and compassion. It can come from a lot of places, but that's one place that I think I've seen it quite a bit. But God's view of humanity, God's view of the human condition is one of compassion and tender sadness, if I can use that word. Have you ever been saddened by the state of human life as you look around at what's going on, as you watch the news? Have you ever been deeply saddened about what it all looks like? This is a wonderful world. I think all of us would attest, we, we live in a great country. We have been incredibly blessed. We have so much to be thankful for. But we can have those moments, can't we, when we are deeply touched by the condition of life around us, whether it's somebody that we know personally or it's something that we see that just breaks our heart. There is something very sad and even pathetic about humankind, and I say that because of the problem of sin. It's all because of sin, right? 
for all of our human knowledge and human ability and our potential and our sophistication and expertise, there are still areas of life in which we are so weak and, and vulnerable and broken. I think about a story I once heard about a man who had a severe drinking problem. He'd been out drinking all night and he came home drunk and his, his wonderful devoted wife who'd been with him for 30 plus years took him by the arm and walked him upstairs, got him to the bedroom, tucked him into bed, kind of cleaned him up a little bit. And as she laid him on the pillow, her heart was broken for her husband to see this yet again. And she said, do you want me to pray for you? And he garbled out, yeah, sure. So she kneels down next to his bed. She begins to pray. Dear Lord, I pray for my husband who lies here before you drunk. And before she could get any further, he interrupted. Don't tell him I'm drunk, you fool. Just tell him I'm sick. Sometimes we think we can hide our sins from God. We can't. Sometimes we think that our problems, be it alcoholism or anything else, that God doesn't see it, or worse yet, that God doesn't care. Friends, I'm here to tell you that God cares. He cares immensely. More than we know, more than we remember. He sees the lostness, the messed upness, if I can say that, the miserableness of our human condition, and he has compassion. He has pity. He sees us and he weeps. We act like sheep without a shepherd, Jesus said. That's our problem. We need a shepherd. So God made a way for us. God didn't just look down from his throne on heaven and feel sorry. No, he did something. He sent a shepherd. He sent his one and only son, Jesus, who could be the deliverer, who would bring us out of this lost place, this desperate, miserable place, and be our great shepherd, full of compassion. That brings us to the next teaching in this story. It's the principle of provision. Jesus is our great provider. Jesus provides for both our bodies and our souls. He demonstrates his divine power here to control the world's food supply, which is why they were clamoring after him, no doubt. They would always have food if he was around doing this. But the end of verse 34 tells us that before Jesus ever gave them something physical, something to eat, he gave them something much more important. He gave them spiritual truth, spiritual bread. It says he taught them many things. Now in John's version of this story, a little bit after the, the story itself, Jesus makes this declaration to those around, I am the bread of life. That means that Jesus is the one who provides the bread that keeps you alive in this world today. What you will eat when you go home today after worship uh, comes from Jesus. You might think your spouse prepared it or somebody else, but it comes from Jesus. But more importantly, Jesus is the one who can give you life in the world to come. So when you're dead and gone from this place, he can give you life in, in the next world. Only Christ can do that. There's no other God, no other supreme being in the, in the universe that has the power to forgive sin and restore a relationship to God that can give you an eternal life. Now, as I thought about this story, I, I wonder, and I think maybe many of us do, how did this small little bundle of bread, five barley loaves, we're told in one of the Gospels, and two little fish, how did it turn into this mountain of food? Twelve basketfuls of pieces left over. How did that happen? 
Uh, maybe you've watched America's Got Talent or uh, the, the World's Best and some of those kind of shows where you have these magicians that do some pretty amazing things. I, I mean, did Jesus just kind of take a napkin and put it over the top of a basket and then poof, there was the bread? Or did he take a basket like the one that Doug held up for the children and he lifted it so high that nobody could see inside and poof, it's full? How did it happen? We might want to focus on the miracle, right? People that we are. But God wants us to focus on him. In fact, next week, as we continue in Mark's gospel, we'll see that Jesus chides his disciples for not understanding about the bread and for kind of missing the whole point of the miracle. The lesson is, don't just hunger for bread, hunger for God. Don't just seek the blessing, seek the blesser. Don't just look for provision from God, look for God himself. Don't get confused about the meaning of this. Everything you need is in Christ. It's not in this world. That brings us to the last principle this morning, the principle of stewardship. Give God what you have. It's not in Mark's version, but in John's version, we're told that the bread, the five loaves and the two fish, actually come from a little boy. Maybe it was his lunch or dinner or whatever, but he had the food. Apparently the only food that the disciples could find. So this little boy giving up his five loaves and two fish teaches us that the little that we have can be made much if we will put it into the hands of God. And that's a point that's made in 1 Kings 17 with the story of the widow of Zarephath. Do you remember that story? There was a, a severe famine in the land of Israel in the time of the prophet Elijah. And this widow and her son were starving because of the famine. Many people were. She only had a tiny bit of flour uh, for which to make bread and just a little bit of oil by which to make maybe one cake. But Elijah comes along and he directs this woman to trust God and to make for him one cake. To use up, essentially, what she had, the flour and the little bit of oil that was hers to feed him first. And then if she was trusting God, what God would do is replenish the supply of her flour and oil, not just for herself, but for Elijah and, and many others. And that's exactly what God did. If you remember the story, she made the little cake for Elijah, and then God gave her jar after jar of flour and jug after jug of oil and she was able to feed herself through the rest of the famine and others as well. There's an old saying that says, little is much when God is in it. Have you heard that? Little is much when God is in it. Now, you might not feel like you have very much to, to give to God or to offer to God in his service, but God wants you to simply use what you have, what you've given to him. This church in its history, and we're celebrating our history right now with the 150th that's coming, and it's great for these stories to, to begin coming out because we need to hear these. These are affirming and life-giving stories in our midst. But God has done some amazing things through some of the unsung heroes in this congregation. And I could mention dozens just based on the stories that many of you have shared with me. But we have so many people who work tirelessly behind the scenes to do things to bless other people and to just live out their faith in God. Uh, I'm just going to mention a couple, okay, without meaning to diminish in any way the contributions of the rest of you. Rita Metamar. Rita is willing to respond to the need for food when that's given to her. Uh, I think about uh, Flora Bouvi and April, uh, who for, is it like 15 to 20 years, uh, have made little hoodie towels and then delivered them to the moms and the families for their newborn babies. For like two decades, that has been going on. 
Or I think about somebody like Rebecca Vandenberg, who oversees our church website and all of our video production and live streaming, coordinates all of that for us. You can think of your own examples, and you probably have some of your own. That's great stuff, folks. Saints like these consistently bring their five hours and their two hands to God and say, Lord, you can have mine. You can have mine. Friends, any one of us can make an enormous difference in another person's life merely by talking to them or being willing to pray for them. I remember at the church that I served in Muskegon, there was a member, a lady uh, named Barb, who had a conversation with a couple in a shopping store uh, or in a grocery store. They were total strangers to her. But for whatever reason that day, as they entered into conversation, the conversation went deeper and deeper, and it became a significant life conversation in which Barb was speaking life into these people's, uh, into their life. And she prayed for them at the conclusion of that conversation. Well, a couple of weeks later, Barb got a thank you note in the mail from these two people. And she couldn't even remember their names. But she had given them her name and just mentioned coincidentally the church that she was attending. Those people called the church, got her address, and sent her a letter thanking her for the difference that she made in their lives in Myers or wherever it was that day. Friends, we never know how mightily God might use us in his service. He's the great multiplier, right? That's what this story tells us. When you're working with the Lord of the universe, two plus two isn't always going to be just four. And five plus two isn't necessarily going to be just seven. God will take that and he will use it for his glory and to do great things not just among his people, but for the people of the world who will see this and say, what a mighty God you serve. Notice in the story that even though Jesus was the one who multiplied the bread, that he used the disciples to distribute it to the people, they served the people. They were the hands and the feet of Jesus. You know what? So are you. So are you. So let me wrap up by summarizing those five principles for us this morning. Then we'll pray. Be willing to be held accountable. Be a Sabbath keeper and rest. Be compassionate like Jesus. Believe in Jesus as your provider and as your Savior. And lastly, be a good steward. And just give what you have. I pray that God will help us to follow those principles uh, and to do it faithfully and that we can and we will be the loving hands and feet of Jesus Christ to a lost, broken, and dying world. To God be the glory. Let's pray, please. Father in heaven, we thank you that you allow us as your children, as your servants, to walk with you and to enter into fellowship with you and to be your instruments, the vessels by which you carry out your sovereign will and you demonstrate your mighty power in the earth. Lord, thank you for the life and the person and the miracles and the teachings and the death and resurrection of Jesus that point us to what a mighty God you are. You are mighty to save and Lord, we thank you that you have compassion on us. You have mercy upon us. You care for us in ways that we can't begin to understand. And Lord, I pray that you would help each of us to be like Jesus in every way, to be compassionate and to be those who get our rest when we need it and to be willing to be held accountable and most of all, to believe in you to trust you with our lives, to trust you with our resources, with our abilities, with everything that you've given to us. 
Lord, you are our provider and you are our savior. And you call us to be good stewards of what you've given to us, to simply return to you what you have entrusted. And so, Lord, we do that now as we receive our morning offerings. We ask you to bless these gifts, bless those who are giving, and bless the deacons and the consistory as they try to faithfully and wisely administer these gifts for the cause of your kingdom and for the building up of your church. So, Lord, receive our thanks, and we worship you with these gifts in Jesus' name. Amen.